Yeah, yeah. So if okay. you're ready, well, we'll start. So today we'll have the, the pleasure to listen to Swan Marx from Nantes, who will speak about uh, asymptotic stability of a one-dimensional wave equation with set value damping. And today is a bit uh, uh, exceptional because we, we had some consolation. So at the end of the talk, we'll have some time to, to discuss uh, a little more about uh, the topic presented by Swan. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you uh, to the organizers. Um, so yeah, uh, today we'll talk about uh, a one dimensional wave equation uh, and in particular the well poisonness of uh, such an equation and the asymptotic stability. And this uh, one dimensional wave equation is, uh, is uh, not common because here we will focus on the case where we have a set value dumping which is a term that I will explain during the talk. So this is a joint work with uh, Yassine Chitour from uh, L2S in Paris and uh, Guillaume Mazanti in INRIA in Paris. So here is the system that we will focus on. So this is a kind of classical wave equation, except that at the boundary, we have some inclusion of, uh, of uh, the time derivative of Z evaluated at, t, uh, at x equal to one and the space derivative of Z uh, evaluated at x is equal to one. So this is a strange uh, equation, but if sigma, for instance, is a graph of a function, so you have uh, C, uh, the space derivative of Z, which is related by a function of uh, the time derivative of Z, then you have some, uh, wave equation with a nonlinear dumping. And among the dumping that we can consider, we can, for instance, include the saturations that are uh, nonlinearities that model in uh, amplitude constraints and that are really uh, used a lot in automatic control theory. But sigma might be also the graph of a set valued map. And among the set valued map that we can consider, you can consider the sine function. The sine function may, for instance, um, represent some dry dumping, or it is also used a lot in the in automatic control, for instance, in the context of uh, slightly, mock, slightly mock control. So for this system, we have two questions. The first one is the wall poisonness. So in general, it is, this is not uh, that difficult when sigma is the graph of a function. But since here we have uh, an inclusion, this, is not, uh, this looks not that trivial and also some asymptotic uh, stability results. So whether the trajectories of the system goes to zero and has some stability with respect to the initial condition. This system has been studied a lot uh, in the literature uh, in the case where sigma is the graph of a function. So among all the references that I have listed here, uh, we can mention some, uh, some, uh, some papers that deal with a higher dimension than just one, okay? So the result in this case is uh, quite more general. The only difference is that here we are considering uh, a set valued at the boundary. And something that has to be noticed also is that most of these results hold in H1, it's not a H2, it's a H101 times L201. Okay, so now here uh, I will give a summary of what we have. The viewpoint that we adopt is that we transform the wave equation into a discrete time equation that could be also called, for instance, a difference equation. And this is really important because this viewpoint allows us to establish several results. So well poisonness and asymptotic stability in some LP spaces. So, which is in contrast with the result that I have mentioned before, because in the result that I have mentioned before, it was just P is equal to two. And uh, we have also some necessary and sufficient conditions for the well poisonness and some results of the asymptotic stability. We're able to uh, establish some optimal decurates in some special cases of a function, when, the, when sigma is the graph of a function. And we have also some input to state stability results. So input to state stability results is, uh, uh, refers to system with some uh, disturbance. 
here uh, the disturbance acts at the boundary. And what says the input to state stability is that as soon as the disturbance is bounded, the trajectories are bounded. And as soon as uh, the, the disturbance goes to zero as t goes to infinity, you have also the convergence of the trajectories to zero. Okay. So to exp to so first I, I would like to explain why we have a discrete time equation and this discrete time equation relies on something which is really classical for one dimensional wave equation which is the, which is the d'Alembert decomposition. So in a sense you are just writing ztx as integral of functions f and g that are Riemann invariants. So this d'Alembert decomposition is really a technique that is related to one dimensional wave equation, because here in a sense, you are saying that T and X has played the same role in a sense, which, which cannot be possible in the case where X is, uh, is of dimension two or higher than two. And from this decomposition, we are able to make a link between F, G, the time derivative of Z and the space derivative of Z, thanks to a matrix, which is a rotation matrix of angle P over four. So this rotation matrix will be really, really uh, important in the, in the statement of uh, some results. And I will uh, illustrate uh, how it is important with some figures uh, when establishing the wall puzzlements. So from now on, we didn't use the boundary conditions. And in fact, for such equation, everything happens. So all the dynamic, uh, dynamical behavior of the system happens in the boundary conditions. So from the first boundary condition, we can make a link between G and F. Okay, so G is equal to minus F. From the second boundary condition, you have some inclusion. And in fact, from the first boundary conditions, you can notice that the system can be expressed only with G. And if we do not S as the set valued map whose graph is R sigma, you end up with this nice inclusion. And in fact, uh, since uh, and in fact, you can characterize the solution of the of the of the wave equation just with this inclusion. Okay, because as soon as you have G, then you have F, and if you have G and F from the D'Alembert decomposition, you are able to have the solution to the wave equation. Okay, so from this uh, uh, inclusion, you can uh, expect some periodicity. Uh, so you can expect that G is too periodic. And from this, uh, from this uh, comment, uh, we can equivalently describe G by a sequence of function Gn that is given by Gnt is equal to Gt plus 2n. And from this sequence of function, well, this sequence and function, in fact, solve, um, solve a, a discrete time multi-valued dynamical system. And this discrete time multi-valued uh, dynamical system, the trajectory of the system is characterizes uh, completely the, the solution of the, of the wave equation. Okay, so uh, in the following, we will uh, give a condition on this, uh, this sequence of function. And from this condi these conditions, we will uh, deduce some well presented result and asymptotic stability. So first we have an existence result, which says that if R sigma, so R is the rotation matrix that I have mentioned before, contains the graph of a universally measurable function with linear growth, then you have existence of solution for every initial conditions in XP which is, the, uh, which is the, the LP spaces that I have mentioned before. So what does mean a universally measurable function? It means that for every uh, Lebesgue measurable function, the composition of phi by this Lebesgue measurable function is Lebesgue measurable. Phi with the linear growth means that uh, if G is in LP, then the composition of phi by uh, G is in LP. We have also a kind of converse uh, result, which says that if there exists a solution for every initial condition in XP, then R sigma contains the graph of a universally measurable function and the, and the graph of a function with linear growth. 
Okay, but it is not exactly a converse uh, uh, theorem, um, and it is not satisfactory uh, from now. But fortunately, we have also a uniqueness result. And uh, in fact, it is a necessary and sufficient conditions. So we know that there exists a unique solution to the wave equation if and only if R sigma is equal to the graph of a universally measurable function with linear curves. So I will uh, illustrate this result with some figures next, but I just want to, to notice that the statements that I have, I have given uh, from now were uh, for P less than plus infinity. But it also holds for P is equal to plus infinity if we replace the linear growth by a weaker assumption, which just says that the function phi, phi, sorry, um, maps bounded sets to bounded set. So now I will give some examples of, uh, of, uh, of uh, for, for the well posedness So here, you have sigma, which is the graph of a function. So you apply the rotation matrix R and you end up with this graph. But here, this is not a graph of a function because if you take, for instance, uh, this term, you can have multiple, uh, multiple uh, value for the, for, for the function. So this is not a graph of a function. But still, uh, this graph, contains um, this set contains the graph of a measurable function with linear if you make an arbitrary, an arbitrary choice of a value for uh, for the function okay but what interesting with this figure is that if sigma is the graph of a function it doesn't mean that you have um, you have existence and uniqueness of the solution so you for sure you can create uh, monsters such as uh, this set sigma and uh, here, uh, if you apply this set sigma, uh, if you apply the retraction matrix to this set sigma, you have this set R sigma, and in R sigma, you can, uh, you, you can uh, create some uh, with linear growth and uh, that is universally measurable, okay? And now, uh, I think this is the most interesting uh, example, even if the, the first example was interesting, in my opinion. So if sigma is the graph of a, of a set value mat, which is the sine function, if you apply the rotation matrix, then you end up with R sigma, which is the graph of a function, okay? And uh, since R sigma is a graph of a function, then you can apply the theorem that I have, mentioned, that I have uh, stated before and deduce that there is, there is uh, existence and uniqueness of the solution in the LP spaces. And which is interesting in my opinion is that uh, for ODEs, when you have a vector field that are uh, defined with a sine function, sine, the, sine, set, uh, sine uh, set value map, you need some sophi sophi sophisticated uh, notion of solution that are Philippov solutions, but here, there is no need of uh, such a concept. So I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, interesting. So now uh, I will uh, talk about the asymptotic stability. So we will just focus on the case where you have existence of the solution. It is not necessary to have uh, uniqueness of the solution, but because asymptotic stability just needs all the trajectories to converge to zero with a stability, which is the Lyapunov stability. Okay. And uh, if so, Lyapunov stability is implied by the fact that the, the norm of Z is non increasing. And in fact, we have a necessary and sufficient condition which uh, establish uh, this fact. If for all elements in the set sigma, you have xy is less or is higher or equal to zero. Okay. So in the case where sigma is a graph of a function, it means that uh, y will be a function of x. And this means that you have this condition. So s times uh, sigma s is uh, higher than higher or equal to zero, which is in fact uh, just the dumping condition, which is uh, well known in the, in, the, in the wave equation literature. Okay, 
So here you can see the region where you have uh, these conditions that is satisfied, and when you apply the when you apply the the, the rotation matrix. Okay, so now you have the Lyapunov stability, but asymptotic stability is decomposed into uh, two properties. The first one is the Lyapunov stability, and also you have the attractivity. So I will give some notion of attractivity. So the strong stability, which is quite natural, so for every solution, you have that uh, the limit of Z goes to zero in the XP uh, topology. Okay, so this is uh, quite natural to have such a result. And you have also the uniform global asymptotic stability, which relies on the concept of KL function, which are function of two variables. And the first variable X uh, is uh, related to the norm of the initial conditions. And the second variable is related to the time. So these are functions that are continuous, increasing in X, decreasing in T, vanishing at zero, and going to zero as T goes to infinity. By uniform here, uh, I refer to the, to the stability uniformly with respect to the initial condition. Okay, And there are also uh, a well-known uh, uh, concept of stability, which is the global exponential stability in the case where BT, beta xt is given by this function. OK. So um, to study the, the asymptotic stability of such an equation, uh, we introduced the concept of real iterated sequences, which is related to the dynamical system for sure, and uh, which consists in uh, seeing uh, the system as, um, as a discrete time equation. And you don't, uh, you don't use gn, but you, ju you just use xn, which is a, a real sequence, OK? And in fact, for all t, so you evaluate gn at t, gn, gn t is a real iterated sequence. And uh, it provides particular solutions to the wave equation where uh, the solution is constant for all n. Okay. And what I want to say here is that st studying these real iterated sequences might be uh, really uh, powerful to study the asymptotic stability. And we will, I will give some a condition on these real iterated sequences, uh, and which implies asymptotic stability, uh, either uh, the, the strong stability or the UGAS uh, stability that I, have, that I have introduced before. So for this uh, sequence, you have two types of convergence. The first one is a simple convergence to zero. So you just have some convergence to zero as n goes to infinity, and some uniform convergence to zero, uh, which is given by this statement. So I, I won't go into details on this. So we have first an, uh, a first result, uh, which um, characterizes some stability uh, with respect to the real iterated sequence. So if p is less than plus infinity, you have a strong stability if and only if the real iterated sequences converge simply to zero. And if p is equal to plus infinity, we have a better result. So you have the equivalence between the strong stability and the U gas. And you have uh, real iterated sequences that converge uniformly to zero. So uh, this is, these are conditions that are necessary and sufficient. But which is interesting is that the strong stability for p less than plus infinity is not equivalent to u gas. For instance, if you take a function s, which is given uh, here. So now uh, we have another result, which says that if the wave equation is u gas and sigma satisfies a sector condition at infinity, that I will explain uh, right now, then the wave equation is u gas in xp. So sector condition and infinity, if you think of sigma as the graph of a function, it just says that this function behaves as a linear function uh, at infinity or for large, uh, for sufficiently large uh, argument of the function. So you can express this in terms of, uh, of sigma. 
or even in terms of S. And we have also this result, which uh, is based on the, on the iteration of S two times. And we assume that the graph of this, uh, this iteration is closed. So why we have this iteration of, uh, of S? In fact, as I told you before, uh, the, the function G is too periodic. And this comes from the fact that from the method of characteristics, you have to touch the bound of the characteristics, but the characteristics needs to touch the bound, the boundary, two times in order to have a, a good result, okay? In order to characterize the, the asymptotic stability. So we have an equivalence between the strong stability in XP and in new gas in X infinity. And uh, also uh, you, we have a kind of strict dumping uh, condition. So which says that if Y belongs to this iterated uh, function, then Y is strictly less than X, okay? Which is represented by this, um, this region, okay? So, uh, in, so this, this region is the strict dumping region. So you just have to, to avoid the, the, the red lines, okay? So which is interesting is that S is a strict dumping implies strong stability, but the converse is false. If you consider, for instance, a S function, which is given by this function, then you have in fact a strong stability. You have even more, you have a finite time stabilization, but uh, you don't have S as a strict dumping because it belongs to this, uh, to this, uh, to these lines that are not, uh, that has to be avoided for the strict dumping. So as a conclusion, um, what we have done, we have transformed the wave equation into a discrete time equation. And uh, we have provided some necessary and sufficient condition for the well, well poisonedness and the asymptotic uh, stability. And uh, the natural equation would be to study the hyperbolic systems that are given here, because a wave equation as I, uh, that I have written before are uh, a specific example of uh, hyperbolic systems. So that could be really interesting to study this, uh, to this, this, uh, this framework in this case to, uh, to establish results for sine functions, saturation, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, I have finished my presentation, so maybe I was fast. <laughs> Thank you. So are there any questions? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Enrique? Uh, first question is, uh, uh, are you not uh, able to extend uh, uh, some kind of related result to uh, other dimensions, to higher dimensions? Have you I don't think so because um, because uh, we are the the technique really relies on the on the on the d'Alembert decomposition. And the D'Alembert, as far as I, as I know, the D'Alembert decomposition doesn't work with a higher dimension, right? Uh, in fact, well, I have another question is, uh, uh, when you have it being uh, speaking about the sine uh, function, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this remembers me of some uh, other problems in which you consider a maximal monotone operator in, uh, yes. uh, for the boundary. So in that case, uh, I think that there are techniques that uh, uh, allow you to uh, reconsider, the re reformulate the equation in, uh, as an equivalent uh, nonlinear equation with uh, uh, regular uh, functions. So, uh, can you say something on this uh, particular case? On the, on the sine function? For example, a sine function, or if you put a maximum monotone operator on the right hand side, yes. then you can regularize. You can, uh, and you can 
mm. we write the problem and have you have the formulation you have uh, introduced any connection to this kind of uh, regularization or anything um, uh, yeah yeah uh, you so by regularization you mean um, you see the regularization for example you see the approximation yeah 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 um well in fact uh, i don't think there is a link but uh, um so for the sign function we were inspired by uh, some uh, paper due to um true and true uh some uh, Uh, researchers from Lyon and China, if I'm not wrong. The answers uh, one? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, okay. if you want. Uh, actually, you said in this paper, Xu, the, the two Xus, uh, do use some regularization in order to address the, the case of, this, of the sine function with the maximum monotone operator. But we, abs we absolutely do not do that. And yeah. we avoid any higher... Uh, level, uh, I mean, uh, operator theory or whatever. And despite this, our elementary approach, as you can have seen, we have optimal results regarding the existence of solutions because we have identified that essentially the, the, in our discrete time system, we need this property of being universally measurable. Mm. So which is a, a sigma algebra strictly in between The, 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 the Borel one and the mm. Leben one. And that provides optimal result for existence of solution. So um, it, there is no connection at all with uh, this regularization and we obtain much better results. At least for this one dimensional wave equation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. As Swan said, all of that is based on reinterpretation of D'Alembert formula. So it's one fully one dimensional solution. And it doesn't go further. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing that there is a question by Sheriff Masirouès. Yes, Sheriff Masirouès. C'est Sheriff Amatouja. Ah, pardon. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, yes, I have some some question about uh, your your uh, matrix rotation. You know. Yeah. I think that this uh, matrix rotation is is comes from the characteristic of this wave equation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yes, but if you have not uh, lines, but if you change your uh, the, the main uh, the principal, if you change that x x by another operator elliptic, for example, in one It dimension, case, you have uh, you have curves. Mm -hmm. You have curves as uh, characteristics, real curves. Mm -hmm. uh, what will become this rotation, the, the, this matrix? For parabolic equations? For this wave equation, but your, uh, you, you can replace ZXX, the, the second derivative in, in space, mm -hmm. by another operator, for example, uh, I don't know, something like... Uh, A Z X uh, X. Ah yes. Um, so, for instance, if you if the velocity of the wave equation depends on the on the space. Au lieu de prendre Z X X, tu prends l'opérateur, par exemple A Z X, mm -hmm. le tout dérivé en X. Ah oui. Ok. Um, I think it's uh, yeah for sure uh, this is uh, this is for so so what I have presented here is about uh, velocities uh, for the hyperbolic system that are independent of the of the space and uh, in the case where we have uh, velocities that doesn't depend on the on the that depends on the on the space variable I think that we can do uh, things. Uh, I know uh, some uh, non-papers about this. Um, we just have to consider the integral of uh, of this uh, of these uh, velocities uh, uh, on the domain, 
but uh, we I don't know exactly what it will become in fact um, but that's an interesting uh, question is that okay Sharif Sharif oui c'est c'est bon Je peux, je, peux, je peux continuer question, avec ma question ou pas, non mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Cool. Si Très bien. Yeah, because uh, this question is, is linked with, uh, with uh, the possibility to look to the same problem mm -hmm. uh, for uh, hyperbolic systems. If... Sure. Uh, symmetric hyperbolic systems, if the, if the, the angle values of the, the main uh, matrix are not constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you take a diagonal hyperbolic system, if they are not constant, the characteristics are not, are not uh, straight lines. Sure, and yes. And then uh, you will have... But, uh, but my question now is the following. If yes. you take this, uh, the same example uh, so, for the well-posedness, Mm -hmm. I think that you can solve. Uh, is it possible to do like this? You take any the, the same wave equation, mm -hmm. but in uh, but in, um, in 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 the, in the boundary x equal one, mm -hmm. you put any 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 data, a function of time, any function of time, then you solve your equation. It gives you, uh, you know, once it is solved. Uh, instead, uh, you can solve uh, z in zero equal zero and z in one equal a function, yes. certain function that uh, you, you will you will get uniqueness in the appropriate space, mm -hmm. and then uh, you consider the operator, which uh, with this data associate, you know the z. z the, the, the derivative in time and the derivative in x in one, yes. these traces, these two traces. And then you have to solve just a problem, mm -hmm. as said Enrique, which is uh, something, uh, it's a problem, which is, uh, I mean, uh, which is reduced to the boundary. Yeah, for sure, yes. Is it possible uh, to do like this? Uh, I, mean, I don't know. Just uh... yeah, yeah, that's uh, interesting. So, so maybe so uh, it's just an expectation. But uh, when you look at this matrix, yes, for sure, the the matrix here will. So I I think if I understood well, this matrix will depend on the on 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 x. It's, it is what we, you you say, right? In a sense, so maybe it will be multiplicative on X. operator. Yes. In X. So. So in fact, here you will. I think that what will happen is that you evaluate this matrix at uh, X is equal to one. I suppose. So I think that uh, we may. So I cannot say uh, it in. A, I cannot uh, ensure that uh, it would be true, but uh, you may uh, find results that are similar to the one I have presented. So, but maybe you won't have, I don't know, uh, this uh, nice rotation, so this nice angle P over four. So maybe you will have another angle or maybe you won't have any uh, rotation matrix. I don't know. So I think that that will be a rotation matrix, but maybe the angle will will change with respect to the the value of the matrix uh, x evaluated at x is equal to one. You see? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so there is a, a last question by Yassine Mokhtari. And, and well, it will be the last because uh, finally Guilherme Mazanti has, uh, has agreed to give uh, a short talk on the, the follow-up of this talk. So, so 
only one last question. Mark, thank you. Thank yes. you, Silva. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so is there any possibility to extend this this approach to uh, set value damping depending on time? So a set of uh, depending time feedback. Uh, it would be good. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, yes, we thought about this. Uh, so we think it's possible. Um, but I... Uh, Yeah, that could be interesting, for instance, in the case where uh, you have a switched uh, control, for instance, you are switching the control. So I think that we wrote something about this, but uh, I don't remember if, I think it's possible, but uh, I don't have any further answer for this. Sorry. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, so let's thank again uh, Swan for this very nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> And, and so let's jump to the to the next talk uh, by Guilherme Mazanti. So I yes, stopped uh, the sharing, right? Yes, uh, I yes, have I, uh, my slides here. Up, let me share them. Uh, just a minute, let me share the slides. And it's uh, here. You see them? Yeah, it's working fine. Yes. Great. Okay, so so let's continue if you're ready. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the next talk will be uh, presented by Guilherme. So I would like to especially thank him for having accepted like uh, 10 minutes ago to, <laughs> to give a talk. <laughs> and uh, he will uh, give a, a short uh, talk on the asymptotic behavior of the one-dimensional wave equation with set value banner and damping. And as I said, this is uh, the follow-up of, of the previous talk. Right, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you also for the, the organizers for uh, for uh, inviting me to, to fill this gap in the, the schedule and uh, complete uh, a little bit of the talk by uh, by Swan. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do the sequel of the, the, the previous talk. And um, essentially, I'm going just to sum up a lot of things, bit the things a little bit in the beginning, and then talk a little bit about what other kinds of results you can get with this idea of uh, transforming wave equations into uh, essentially a discrete time set valued uh, dynamical system. And uh, so, just to recall, essentially, uh, the, the well, I would say the main equivalences that we get. In the um, in the talk by Swan is that we're starting we started studying this wave equation here with a directly boundary condition here and the set valued boundary um, uh, damping here in a space uh, which is an LP space so it's LP with uh, W1P zero in the directly boundary and uh, you, we can check just using the Lambert decomposition that it, this is equivalent to study. Uh, one of the um, remaining, um, one of the characteristics, one of the remaining variants of the equation, which is just the function g, because the other one is just equal up to the sign. And this function is in LP log of minus one plus infinity. And actually, since here we have an interval of size one and uh, we have a wave that goes, reflects in the Dirichlet boundary and propagates back to the boundary, essentially we have a dynamical system of period two. And so we can pick this Riemann characteristic G here and cut it in intervals of size two. So from minus one, one, from one, three, and so on, as one said in his talk, to get a sequence um, GN, such that uh, essentially if you glue all the GNs together, we get back to the G that is here. And this sequence is a sequence of functions in LP of minus one, one, which satisfies this inclusion here, which is our discrete time uh, system. And what is interesting is that we have not only equivalence of uh, solutions from a functional point of view, but we also have equivalence of norms in the sense that uh, the norm of the solution Z can be related to the norms of GN. And so if you want to understand the asymptotic behavior of this wave equation here, this is essentially the same as understanding the asymptotic behavior of this thing here, which is in a certain sense, a little bit uh, simpler. Okay, so to sum up, studying this equation in 
the an LP type space is the same thing as studying this inclusion, uh, where uh, as for using the same notations as in Swan uh, talks, uh, S here is a set valued map whose graph is equal to the rotation of the boundary condition that we have for the wave equation. And we remain here in an LP space. So Swan gave some uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for uh, stability. And what I'm going to do now is try to understand a little bit more the decay rates. So essentially you have the criteria, necessary and sufficient conditions saying, well, under these conditions, solutions converge to zero, but how fast do they converge to zero? And of course, this depends highly on what kind of boundary condition we put. And uh, what I'm going to assume is the following. We're going to assume that our boundary condition, so the set sigma, uh, is bounded between the graph of a function, q, and its inverse. It's a function which is zero in zero, which is below the identity, some uh, technical conditions here, and essentially the graph of my, um, of my boundary condition is in this blue region here. I just want, since I want to give some decay rates, I just want to be uh, control how far away I am from the axis here, because the axis corresponds to Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions into which I have uh, no decay. So I just want to give some uh, quantitative behavior on how far I, I am from the axis through this function Q here. And actually what you can show is that uh, if we rotate this, if we rotate this, essentially what we get after the rotation is that our set valued map S, uh, which defines our dynamical system, it should be in a certain region here defined by two functions Q and minus Q, where Q can be easily defined from the function uh, small Q that is given here. So, and this means essentially them that I'm uh, away from identity here, identity meaning just uh, reflection with no sign change of sign and minus identity, which is reflection with a change of sign. And so the question is, can we characterize the asymptotic behavior of solutions? And the first result in this sense is that actually uh, the asymptotic behavior is determined by the iterates of this function Q here. So if sigma satisfies, so if my uh, boundary condition of the wave equation satisfies a nonlinear sector condition with uh, the functions small q and capital Q as before, then what you can prove is that it's L infinity, it's L infinity norm, or it's norm, it's L infinity type norm, can be bounded by the, um, the iterates of Q, which depends on time. So the T over two iterate of Q applied to the initial L infinity norm, where here I use this uh, bracket notion to denote iterates of Q. So essentially studying the asymptotic behavior amounts to studying iterates of uh, this Q here. And what is interesting is that, well, here I presented this for all infinity. We have a similar expression for LP, but if some additional terms that come from the fact that functions in LP may explode, and so you have to uh, get a little bit more, uh, take a bit more attention to details of what happens at infinity, but we have a similar expression in LP. And actually you also have lower bounds if we uh, assume some sort of anti sector condition, so instead of saying that I'm between these two functions, if I assume that I'm outside of this region, so in the red zone here, if my boundary condition is in this red zone here, I can give a lower bounds on the solutions. So in particular, if my boundary condition is equal to this function Q or equal to the function Q minus one, then we have the exact asymptotic behavior, which is given by iterates of Q applied to some, uh, to some constant, which is essentially the norm of the initial condition. And so with this result, studying the asymptotic behavior of our equation is essentially studying what happens when we compose these functions Q here. And uh, it turns out that it depends a lot on the derivative of these on zero. So uh, here we present uh, three different cases. The one where the derivative of the small q in zero is zero. The one where it is a constant between zero and one and the one where it is equal to one. So in the case where it's equal to zero and this uh, has been shown for uh, some uh, wave equations previously uh, by, uh, by many authors. Uh, essentially the idea is that it's going to decay to zero slower than exponentially. And uh, what you can prove is that we can characterize the speed uh, through the solution of a certain differential equation. So in other words, what you can say is that if Q prime of zero is zero, there exists a sequence 
which is equivalent to uh, sequence Tn, which is equivalent to N, such that the nth iterate of Q is equal to the a solution of a certain differential equation at time Tn. And this differential equation is nothing but uh, V prime of T is equal to minus the boundary condition applied to V with some constants here that comes from our, uh, from our rotation. And with initial condition equal to the initial condition of uh, our sequence. And on there, a technical assumption here that is actually satisfied in, uh, in, in, uh, in almost all cases, we can actually prove that uh, it's not only equal to V of Tn, but it's equivalent to V of N. And so we get the precise asymptotic behavior of this sequence. And so, as I said before, the precise asymptotic behavior of solutions. So uh, this result is very similar to, um, to uh, and is inspired by results by uh, Van Constantinople Martinez uh, from uh, 2000. But uh, I generalize here for set value damping. And here we have this conclusion that is a little bit stronger under this additional assumption. Now, what happens if uh, the derivative of Q between is between zero and one? In this case, we have essentially exponential convergence with rate, which is given by the um, R -tang R arc tangent hyperbolic of Q prime of zero. And uh, what you can show is that in general, this sequence QN here, behave, its logarithm behaves as minus lambda N and under some additional assumptions, which are uh, satisfied for most uh, of the functions Q that we can uh, come up with. Uh, so under a certain technical additional assumption, we can actually get that QN of X zero is um, behaves exponentially as exponential of minus lambda n. So it's upper bounded by a constant and lower bounded by the inverse of this constant times the same exponential here. So essentially what this means is that linear behavior of sigma close to zero gives us exponential decay, which somehow um, somehow uh, expected from uh, previous results on the literature in the case where sigma is not set valued, but just a function or a smooth function. In the final case where uh, Q prime of zero is equal to one, now it's good to recall what happens in the case where Q of X is equal to the identity. In this case, actually, we have convergence to zero in finite time. And uh, here, essentially, this means that we are tangent to this case at the origin. And being tangent to this case at the origin, what you can prove is that we decay faster than any exponential. So uh, the limit of exponential of lambda n times Qn of x0 is equal to 0 for every lambda here. So we decay faster than any exponential. And again, under some additional assumptions, you can actually quantify that saying that it's an exponential of an exponential an exponential of minus an exponential of n. So uh, we get uh, faster than expo any exponential in this case, which is uh, the nonlinear version of the, the finite time convergence when, um, when Q here is the identity. So this is the kind of behavior that we get from Qn. And using the previous result, we can get um, the precise asymptotic behavior of the solutions of uh, our uh, wave equation. Now, uh, just to illustrate that, so here are these some results that were previously given in the literature in the case of um, damping, of uh, boundary dampings that are given by functions. And um, so for very uh, different kinds, so for polynomial case, polynomial with uh, some additional terms, the exponential of minus one as to the power p and so on, there were previously um, asymptotic uh, behaviors that are given in the literature uh, that describe how fast solutions converge to zero. And what you can show is that uh, with our formalism, we can get all of these results, but we can uh, get away from the energy space x2 here and work in any uh, x uh, p or x r with r between on one and plus infinity, including uh, plus infinity. And actually, uh, one of these previous results was actually only an upper bound here, z of t was less than or equal to this exponential. And uh, what you can show is that we can obtain the precise asymptotic behavior in the last case, so we can get an equivalence for the z of t just by studying what happens to the iterates of the function capital Q that corresponds to this case here. So the analysis that we did in the paper is that uh, in the case where sigma is the graph of the function defined by this, then we get an explicit, an equivalence, uh, an equivalent uh, for uh, the norm of the solution as t tends to infinity, which is of course compatible with the upper bound that was given here. So it was exponential of minus a constant 
times t to the power one over p plus one. So here for k equals zero, we have t to the power one over p plus one, but you actually uh, identify the constant here. It's alpha of zero, it's just p plus one power one over p plus one. We identify the constant in front of the exponential and we actually get the other terms that we get uh, in the sequel of the, the expression. So we get the precise asymptotic behavior to zero in this case, just by studying the iterates of Q. Now, uh, another result that you can get uh, using this formalism is um, a result of arbitrary slow convergence in the case where, um, where you have some uh, bounds on sigma. Essentially, what you say is that the boundary condition here uh, is included in the set which are represented in blue here. So which means that the boundary condition belongs to the blue region here. And in particular, we think of this as the case where the boundary condition is saturated. So it means that um, the, let's say we have some uh, straight line here, but then after some point it's saturated, so it becomes constant or it's just upper bounded by a constant here and then uh, bounded by a constant here in the other sense. And when you rotate that, we get a picture like this. And there was a conjecture in the, the paper by uh, Van Kostenoble and Martinez in 2000, saying that uh, they expected to have arbitrary slow convergence in this case. That is, uh, if you take a phi of t that converges to zero as slow as you want, we can always get a solution that, um, that converges to zero slower than, um, than phi. And uh, in, uh, in this paper, if I'm not mistaken, this result is, uh, is proved for uh, iterated logarithms here uh, in the place of phi. And here we can generalize it and also generalize uh, the kind of uh, boundary conditions that you get. And the idea is essentially that under this boundary condition here, what happens is that when you are at infinity, we're going just to decay uh, by subtracting a constant. And so if X here is really large, we're going to decay really, really slow because we're subtracting a constant from X at each step, we're not dividing x by something to get exponential convergence, we're just subtracting something that is constant. And so it takes a lot of time to converge. And so the strategy to prove this result is to build some suitable initial conditions such that in very small intervals, they take very large values. And these large values take a lot of time to decrease to zero. And we can uh, construct it, uh, the, the, the counterexample, um, that this, uh, this proof in this way. Uh, so uh, I know I'm about to run out of time, but I just want to show the, some uh, some uh, other applications of uh, of this formalism. The first one, as Swan talked about, the sign set valued map, which is this one, and when we rotate it, we have the graph of a very nice function. And using our study, we can actually describe precisely what is the asymptotic behavior when the boundary condition is given by this. Now, if you look a little bit at the previous results that I gave, with this boundary condition here, we don't have um, stability to the origin. But uh, what you can prove is that we converge to something that we can identify explicitly in the terms of, um, of initial condition. So from the previous results, there exists a unique solution to this. And it's quite easy, as Swan said, because after the rotation, we have a function. So we don't have to deal with, um, with Filipov uh, solutions, we can just use our formalism. And uh, if, we have, if you take a solution of the wave equation, we can actually characterize what is the limit to which it, each treat, uh, to which it converges in terms of the, uh, the um, Riemann characteristic of the initial condition G0 here. We can define a G infinity and we get, um, and we, if we consider a solution that starts from this G infinity, this solution is too periodic and our solution converges to this solution. And uh, the convergence holds in a finite time in the case where we are in, uh, in an infinity. So, uh, so this allows us to characterize uh, exactly the asymptotic behavior of, um, of, uh, of solutions in the case of the sine function. Now, um, this had been done before in the literature in the paper, which was already cited before by Xu and Xu. 
Uh, now, the difference with our framework is that we can get existence and uniqueness of solutions in a straightforward manner, applying our previous results instead of using semi group theory in the Hilbertian setting in the paper by Xiong Xu. In their paper, they, uh, they, are, they stick to the Hilbertian setting, but here the difficulty of considering the Hilbertian setting or consider any LP space is the same. And we can identify explicit the limit. They also have an expression for the limit, but which is given in terms of a Fourier series expansion. And just to conclude, I just want to, to say that uh, these previous results also, um, uh, this, this formalism is also good for considering uh, disturbances in the boundary condition. So for instance, if my boundary condition is belonging to a set plus a disturbance here, uh, we can uh, study input to state stability, meaning that um, we can try to bound the norm of the solution as something that depends on the initial condition and that converges to zero as tension, uh, t tends, uh, tends to infinity, plus something that depends on a certain bound of the disturbance in a certain functional space. And uh, all I want to say is that um, we can apply our formalism also to this case and give a precise notion of solution and uh, show that we have existence and uniqueness of solutions and show results, uh, for instance, guaranteeing that even in the presence of disturbances, our solution converges to zero if the disturbance converges to zero and is well behaved in a certain LP space. And, um, and if you have a certain sector condition at infinity, then we have more than just converges to zero, we have uh, input to state stability with respect to disturbances in L. Okay, so this is just to say that uh, this framework can also be applied to these uh, more general boundary conditions with disturbances and it can answer the typical questions that we have when we consider this kind of problems. Okay, so that's what I want to say. I think I finished. So uh, Sylvain told me to finish before six. It's uh, six it's right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, are there any questions? So if there is, you can raise your hand or, or ask a question. Can I make please? just one comment just to add? Okay, to yes, yes. So you, yeah. everybody has noticed that there is absolutely no concept of Lyapunov function for the asymptotic behavior, the, 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 to address asymptotic behavior. Just you, you study real sequences based on a dynamical system. That's all. Thank you. Uh, okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Yeah. Uh, Enrique, yeah. Yes, uh, you have spoken of, uh, uh, about disturbances on the boundary conditions. So uh, is it possible also to consider the case in which you uh, have disturbance on the equation itself? I mean, you have a, a term on the right-hand side that is going uh, to zero. Uh, maybe you rapidly? Um, yeah, the problem here is that uh, we, uh, we use a lot the structure of the wave equation in order to be able to make this equivalence between wave equation and, um, and the discrete time system. So it uh, will depend on what kind of disturbance, but essentially, if the disturbance is such that uh, techniques based on um, on the Lambert decomposition breaks down, then we cannot uh, use uh, use this technique. If there's still a notion of characteristics and we can follow characteristics in some sense, we can try to say things, but uh, it's not straightforward that's going to work. I'm not sure if it's going to work. So maybe for some particular disturbances it might work, but I think that the disturbance must be really particular in order to not to break down all the structure that we use uh, to, to, to make this, this kind of result. So for us, it's essentially, um, what it can do is essentially disturbance on the, on the boundary. Okay. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? Well, in fact, I have one which is uh, related to the to the comment by Yassine. So he said that you you did not use any uh, Lyapunov functional approach. But would it be possible to derive uh, similar results using uh, using Lyapunov strategy? Uh, well, at least in the 
paper, if I'm not mistaken, we do in a remark show that, uh, for instance, in this linear case here, we can get uh, essentially uh, the same kind of results that we have using the Lyapunov approach, using the classical Lyapunov function for a hyperbolic system with the weight exponential of minus mu x, mm -hmm. uh, plus and minus mu x according to, uh, to each characteristic of the following. And, uh, but uh, with, if I'm not mistaken, a uh, slightly stronger condition, uh, a slightly stronger assumption, if I'm not mistaken, we need the a slightly stronger assumption because we want the things to be defined globally. Um, and for the other results, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for the other results, for so I, th I think the case that most people in the literature are interested in is the case of slow convergence to zero. And in this case, uh, I'm not sure if other works have done this through Lyapunov functions. I think the most the, the 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 if you want to get really precise estimates on the decay rates i think most results have used something similar to uh to the lambert decomposition or, or moment method but uh mm -hmm. i'm not sure if uh yeah. for these kind of cases the yeah, functions maybe to to, to, yeah, to yes, have yeah. okay it it is in principle possible to uh, derive, uh, so let's assume that you're in a case where your uh, function, your sector condition is just a graph of a function, this little q, okay? Mm -hmm. Fine. You are able to write down a Lyapunov equation, exactly a generalization of what uh, Bastin Coron has done, the first one. So it's a Lyapunov, even in the, you can extend it to the, the, the LP, LP, LP setting. Mm -hmm. yeah by mm -hmm. taking the LP norm of the your Riemann invariant. And what you will end up with is essentially integral terms of Q of X to the P minus X to the P, where Q is this big function, okay? okay. And that's how you will try to get the decay. But you have to, then, in order to have an estimate of Lyapunov, you have to do that on the interval of space minus one, one, because you have to integrate there. So you see mm -hmm. that it is much more complicated. I mean, more complicated. You have to work much harder than here because here you just have to look at sequences, one single sequence. It's like you would pick up one point on the interval minus one one, and you follow the real iterated sequence associated with it. You see, you do not have to work with an integral term of coming from a Lyapunov equation. You work much less. And I think that also another point of view is that even if you do this uh, a Lyapunov strategy for this case, you will end up eventually with uh, some sort of iterated sequence, even though um, I yeah. mean, it may not appear like that, but you will end up having to describe the asymptotic behavior of the iterates of Q in order to, uh, to, to, if you want to get the precise behavior of the solution. So, I don't believe that it would uh, simplify the, 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 the technique of proof of the result. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Are, are there any other questions? So, yeah, if not, let's thank the speakers again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, so, thank you all. And, and so next week we'll have uh, Dante Cadiz. And well, so we'll see you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>